So we're doing a video today that I'm hoping is going to be fun. We're going to call this video the case study. And we're basically, I'm going to walk around and we're going to talk about this 55 Pontiac. And the reason I'm calling it the case study, I know what happened to the car back in 1974 and where it came from. And the guy who purchased it after the car was quote unquote restored back in 74. And it's been one owner from them till now. He still owns the car and I'm now cleaning it up and redoing it for him. Now he's had this car painted a handful of times over 50 years of ownership in slightly different variations, but it was never taken down and reworked. It was simply scuffed, fill up the spots and shot. Now that's very old school, old thinking bodywork. And people will argue on a lot of videos today that all those things don't work. Now, there's reasons they don't work. For instance, if your filler is all cracked and you simply fill the cracks and sand it smooth, you didn't fix what's causing it to crack. So you got to dig that out. Um, and a lot of guys will argue, well, there could be stuff happening everywhere that we don't see. And that's where the argument comes in. Do you take the whole car down the metal or do you not? Well, that's something that you've got to assess case by case. And I say that because, again, you wouldn't put 100K into a 55 Pontiac. Now, the way things are going, pretty soon you probably would. But right at the moment, no one is spending huge money to restore this. But it's a nice runner driver. Now, it does have a nice little small block. I'm told it dynoed out at 440 horse. I'm assuming that's at the crank at the engine builders. But I don't care what the details are. All I know is good 350, overbuilt. Uh, you can still drive this really well. But man, oh man, this car does get out of its own way. Aluminum radiator, you know, new brakes. Like, the car's not a shit box. It's good. So, uh, discs on the front. I don't know what he did to lower it, but it's not crazy low, but it's got just a nice stance. It looks sinister outside, but you still got enough clearance for most daily use, you know. It ain't an off-roader, but it ain't super low. Uh, it's got drums on the back, and I think he just went to really expensive shocks on the back with shackles to lower it. He didn't go too crazy. There could be blocks. I'm not sure. But it's, uh, you still got nice suspension for going down the road. And I believe he's got drop spindles on the front. I'd have to confirm that, but honestly, I don't care. The stance is cool when you go down the road. It handles well, but it drives really nice. This is a comfortable car to drive. And something about these Tri-5s, you know, these uh, 55 and later Chevys, they drive really nice. The Buick, the Pontiac, you know, all those cars. Like once they went from that... Uh, kingpin axled front end it's amazing how nice this drives even compared to cars today like now they handle good and they've stiffened them up but if you're going to go cruising in comfort this is the car and a little bit of lowering and what you see here like it handles pretty good it'd take a lot of car to catch this car on the street it is a fast little car that handles half decent so back to the bodywork. Back in 1974, a young guy who was 14 saw this car and it was sitting at a garage where a guy did a lot of body work and stuff. And he had a big junkyard out back. You know, they all had a pile of like 50, 100 cars in the back. And he just wanted to own this car. This was a teenager's dream. And the thing about that is it wasn't a nice car out in the lot. It had been rear-ended. It had been sideswiped, and this whole quarter was pushed in and demolished. And the front fenders, the tops were rotted out. The bottom of the front was rotted out. I think I'm starting to paint the picture, but this car was rough. And it was a 20-year-old car that nobody cared about at the time. So nobody, you know, it is what it is. But the guy wanted this car. And he bought the car off the guys. And the guys did a bunch of the body work. And he'd go up 
and he learnt some of the bodywork. And eventually he got the car together and painted, and it was nice, and he drove the car for a long time. Now, I think he drove it in the winter, but only once and possibly part of another winter. Because, um, you know, these cars, when you were turning 16 and you finally were able to drive your toy, this was driven to school and all that sort of stuff. And then finally he got out of school and he went to work, and then he bought a car he could put mileage on. And instead of getting rid of this, it sat for a while, and then he fixed it up again, worked all the bugs out of it, and drove it for 50 years. Uh, you know, obviously not in the winter. In that time, he painted it two, possibly three times, but at least two times that I know of. They never went into the old 1974 bodywork. They just kind of scuffed, touched up spots, and painted it. Um, so he had a two-tone blue with all the chrome on it, original sort of look. Later, he went to, uh, instead of a dark and light blue, he went to a medium blue, did the whole car, put craggers on it, and he had the little chromed out rubber mud flaps. You know, so it had that early, late 80s, early 90s vibe. But still, you know, kind of original. And then he redid the seats at that point. They're actually holding up pretty good. You can see that there. He's got to take the backs off and retie a few of the buttons. But there's nothing wrong with the seats in the car. They're pretty good. Here's that nice 55 Pontiac only dash. Everyone talks about what a jewel that is, but here you have it. It's a good looking dash. I'm sure the wheel is aftermarket. Or Firebird or something else. Uh, at any rate... These cars all rot up here. The top of the fenders get stone splashed from the bottom and they, well, rashed, and they all chew and rust away. There's great big giant plates welded into the top of the fenders. From here down to this line all the way in there, there's a plate welded in. There's weld right in here and also down in here. So I believe they cut that body line and kept it replaced a bunch of metal. Those are probably off of a 55 Chevy or something else. And they just cobbled it all back together so they could maintain the lines while cutting the rod out. Maybe they made some of it. I don't know. I doubt it because it's pretty decent. But who knows? I know the bottoms were fixed. This door was mint. Might have just come off of another car that was in good shape and they threw it on. The door on the other side had a 5-inch skin put across the bottom and it was full of dents and filled with filler well we pulled the dents and then refilled it the quarter back here was smashed and they put one on off of a 55 chevy and they basically stopped here and they cut it down and around and then it shot forward now the wheel well on the chevy comes up higher and then obviously they don't have that cool speared body line so he went where he could, cut it off, and then they made that, that Pontiac shape by hand. Copying the other side, which was so bad they cut that out and remade that side as well. And then they remade these uh, lowers. Now on this side it was just the lower, but on the other side they actually came way up into here and they had a great big section. It could have been sheet metal, could have been cut from another car, we don't know. This sat in quite a bit. We pulled it out as much as we could, then we filled it and blocked it across, so at least it looks like it fits the car now. It used to look like it was countersunk in. The back had been hit and pushed up, the floor is bent down, so what you're seeing here isn't falling body mounts. The body mounts are all healthy. Um, that tail, the floor under the trunk actually comes down and in. He didn't want to fix that. He said, just make it smooth, good enough. Because, you know, this is a driver. And he's actually going to drive it and do smoke shows. And, you know, there's rubber under this car. So <laughs> he drives this car. And to me, that's more fun than just make it pretty and leave it in the shop. So we sanded a lot of the paint jobs off till we got down to this one. And things seemed to be sound. Or at least as sound as we could hope for. There's a limit to how much money and time we can put into this car. Again, all new steel in here. So let me tell you what was failing in the bodywork from 1974 
to about two years ago. They had a plate in here and they basically used brass uh, rods and it's what they used to call brazing and they put it in with torches, you know, and they just kept feeding the rod into the fire and things warped and it was a very old way of doing it. Nobody had MIG welders back then. Um, everywhere where they did that, about three quarters of an inch on each side of the weld turned green. Now, at first I thought that was just the color of the, say, moisture getting to the brass and it could be. But I'm starting to believe, because it was sticky feeling, when they welded it, I believe a little bit of flux got stuck in there. Between that and the moisture, it created this green, sticky substance, and that's where the filler was letting go. Now, they did that on the fenders, both fender tops, and this quarter panel. They also did it around the front headlights in that area. And those were the areas that were failing. So basically what we had was a car that looked pretty good. And right here, right across this bump, about as wide as I'm showing you, this was all starting to check and shrink and delaminate and it had little swollen areas. And everything filled in between, we had to take a real sharp chisel to, to even attempt to scrape it off. And, uh, but we could go around that weld with that same chisel and just by hand, knock it all off. So once we knocked off all that failing filler, then we had to go in and take some off. Now, I like to use stripping wheels when I take all that stuff off, and we did do that, but I took a hammer, a small hammer and a chisel, and I just knocked it along gently because I wanted to pull the filler off and see what was behind it. I was curious because this is the only car that I've had the opportunity of having a car where the bodywork was 50 years old, and mostly it was doing what it should have been doing. And what we found was everywhere where there was bare metal, there was a lot of swirl in it. So they had took either a 24, maybe a 30, 36 grit, and they cut heavy swirl into the metal. Then they put their white filler, which was kind of that grayish, nasty, dirty white, but you know, 50 years old, who knows how it started out. But I remember the old gray white stuff from back in the nineties when I was tearing old stuff apart back then. And they basically put the filler right on top of the metal. So can you do that? Well, if you want it to last 48 years or more, apparently that'll work for you. But if there's any rust and you bury it, well, it's going to continue to rust under the filler. And this is where the epoxy would come in. Now, I know when you go online, people argue that you need to epoxy it. You need to put the filler and epoxy it later. And it seems nobody can get along on that. This is where you have to decide if you're doing a full-on restoration or are you just going to redo the car that you can drive it for 15 years and then maybe redo it again later? Like, it just depends on your money and your intention. Um, are you leaving it out in the backyard under a tarp? I mean, it doesn't matter which way you fix it at that point because that's not going to hold up no matter what you do. The epoxy will help. Uh, let me put it this way. Rust doesn't stop, it doesn't sleep, and it never goes away. From the day metal is born, a couple hours after, it begins to rust. There is rust impregnated into the metal. You can treat it, you can convert it, there's no way to get it all, and I still believe you're only slowing it down. The genius with epoxy is if it bites in and glues to it, you've stopped oxygen and moisture from getting in, you've slowed it down that much more. So the question to whether filler works on top of metal with a good tooth, absolutely, but it must be good metal. Now, the other things we found as we started taking the filler out, down low there were patches where they had handcrafted all this body line. That was all done with a, an electric spot welder. And it was just lapped and it wasn't countersunk or flanged in. And then they filled it. None of that was failing except a couple spots where there was rust coming from places where the sand, you know, off the tire wore down in this area. There was some rust there because it, you know, the paint got pulled off down to the metal stuff and it went in underneath. But if you did good body work with good tooth, everything seemed to hold with the exception of that green sticky stuff around those welds. Um, 
What we did find, once we took all the filler off, there was no rust under the filler other than the spots I was mentioning. And the cool thing about that is it means anything you put on will seal it and keep the air and moisture out. That's just a reality, right? So depending where you put it, maybe doesn't matter as much as we think it does. Now I believe if you can afford to and you want a perfect car, you take everything down to metal, you do everything, you start fresh, you build the whole car back up. That would be my advice to anyone who has the money or time to do that. But in case you're a blue collar guy, and I'm sorry to say this, I know everybody thinks like, look at my $100,000 trailer queen. And, and there's nothing wrong with that if you've got those means. Uh, the purists, they can go ahead and do that. And if you're a stockbroker and you do really well, maybe Chip Foose builds your car. But if you're a blue collar guy working like a normal job, and your mortgage is paid off or whatever the case is, and you've got, you know, not hundreds of thousands, but maybe thousands. Can you have a hot rod? Well, that's what hot rodding was all about. It was about pulling stuff like this out of the junkyard home, cleaning it up and driving it down the road. Now, you still have to do a minimum to make a car safe. Now, this car mechanically is good. Lots of money had been spent on it mechanically. The bottom of this car is sound. There's no cheating. Good frame, good floors, all the body mounts. I don't know if there's repairs. I didn't look that closely, but I looked enough to see that clearly the guy loves the car and it was maintained and fixed well. Doesn't mean it was repanned or not repanned. I didn't look. I looked under the car. It was solid. There was floor pans. It all looked really, really good. The only thing that concerns me is the body and the paint. We're giving this car a little bit of a refresh and we're not going crazy. Now, this, what I'm doing is not cheap, but it might be a third, maybe less than a third of what a proper full resto would be. Now, I like to do the Camaros and the reason why, and Firebirds, there isn't a panel on those cars I can't buy new. Now, we can touch on that. It don't matter if it's Dynacorn or AMD or... GT, what is a GT car something? GT muscle, muscle car GT. There's pans you can get and fenders for Mustangs and, you know, the cars that are easy to find, Mustangs, Camaros, 57 Chevy, you can buy all the sheet metal brand new. 55 Pontiac, uh, anything Buick, anything AMC, a little harder. So if you want something different, it's going to be different. And like this car, there was no fenders. There was no quarters available. Doors, 55 Chevy doors fit on. We're not going to change the doors. The rest of the car's got filler in it. We're not going for a concourse restoration on a very sought after car. What we're building here is a drivable hot rod. Now, this will not be driven in the winter. It will be kept in the garage. So whether you do top notch level work or you do refresh, I mean, most of this car was taken down where it needed to be. Some spots weren't. The owner's confident that the car's fine. He's probably half right. So with all the work we've done, and we did a lot more than he wanted us to do, this car is going to be just fine. Driven that way, 20, 30. According to that rear fender, if we do the minimum bodywork on this car, the minimum, but, you know, go by those original rules. Lots of tooth with bite. Put your filler on well, clean between layers. You know, the basic, basic, basic bodywork 101 stuff. If you follow those recipes, even very old school bodywork should be able to last you, apparently, you know, 48, 50 years. So, that's why I call this car the Case Study Pontiac. I've enjoyed working on it. Not because it was fun to do the actual work. Uh, this car was a bit of a pain in the rear because we chased a lot of stuff out of it and we chased a lot of bumps out of it with the blocking and the whatnot. Now we're going to prime it, scuff it, and paint it. I have a feeling after I prime it, I'm going to end up doing a little more block work here and there. We'll see what the primer reveals. But the reason this car was fun to do is because I was able to see what 50 years later showed in what used to be old school body job work. 
Now I started doing this back around 91 and I was pretty young, but I kept going to a guy who was building hot rods and Chevelles and, you know, Novas, Camaros, all those cars, right? Mustangs. Um, and anyway, I just kept showing up and learning. I wanted to do it because this was my thing. This is what I wanted to do. Even when I was 13, 14 years old, I knew I'd be involved with this somehow. The best toy I had as a little kid were Hot Wheels. Everything else was just a toy in a box. Those were the Holy Grail toy, right? And this is why. I don't know why I'm like this. There was no mechanics in my family growing up. Everyone was in some rate of business or construction. I was the only car guy. It's just something that happens to you, I suppose. But filler works just fine. So follow the rules. And uh, again, lots of bite. Put your filler on, sand it out, bit of primer, sand it out, do what you got to do. Now, some guys like to creep up on it. I find that takes a long time. And that's where you kind of fill it and block it and fill it and block it. And you keep going and going until eventually you're happy. I find you're better off like with the quarters. Uh, you're going to do that, playing with it here and there a little bit anyway later. But for the first go, don't be afraid. Push your thin layer on, push it into the metal really well, get it to stick, and then flood it on the second coat of filler. Put way more on than you think you'll need. It's all going to end up on the floor, but you're going to get there faster. You'll still have to do it one or two more times lightly and block in. But if you try to go light and put the least amount on, what ends up happening is you're just putting thin layer over thin layer over thin layer. You're going to get lost in the waves. So put lots on, learn to block, block it out. You're still going to, you know, dust into it a little bit later. But in the beginning, you know, a car like this, you can't get like everything's welded together. Uh, now people talk about perfect metal work. Well, if you're a do-it-yourself guy, or you're a guy who's not doing a full-fledged restoration on an aluminum Jaguar or something like that. Yeah, we're not doing that. Like nobody, nobody's going to do perfect metal work on a car like this. Because the time it would take to do that before you did everything else, you could just go buy one. So keep that in mind, right? Um, I know people like to talk a lot about the way and I'm the best and all this other nonsense. But the truth is, these cars weren't put together well at the factory. The gaps were bad, things didn't fit, nobody cared, and guess what? They had guys running around on the floor as they built a lot of this stuff back in the day, and they threw filler and fixed all the mistakes. That's just a fact. There is body filler in a brand new car as soon as you go back to the past. I mean, anything before, I mean, I don't know, the 90s? <laughs> And I mean, even in the 90s, what they did then is they had the robots fill the car with a real fat primer and they had guys blocking some of that out, you know, and some of it would self-level. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. Now, I'm sure in a brand new car today, I don't think there's much filling in, in them, but I'm going to tell you why. It's not because they've gotten better. When you walk up to your 2023 20, or newer anything, have a look at how all the rounded, bizarre shapes fit. They actually make the cars in a way that it hides all the defects. And all the stamping is right there. You can see it. Now, you probably haven't noticed it, but by all means, go look at your car out in the driveway. And if you can't see it, then there's no reason this isn't good enough for you. That's certainly for sure. So, it is what it is. Here's a chunk of filler that was located right here over a big dent where they had welded it all together and hammered it in. Now, I'm going to bend it so you can see that it, it bends. It's still flexible after 50 some years. Now, let me show you the back. There's where the bead of brass was from where they welded it. And this line here shows where the bottom, this is where there was a patch welded onto the bottom and this was electric welded. Now that sticky wet stuff you're seeing, 
it's an illusion. It's not wet. It's dry as a bone. I believe that is the resins that eventually came from the filler and just sat there. Um, hard to tell on this one in the camera, but there's swirl in it. So that was the biggest failure on this car. You can actually see those round spots. That's where all the electric welds were. So this would have been in here, I believe. See, that's that shape. And again, it's not excessively thick, but it's definitely thicker than what we've got. Um, and this is how we could see where all the welds were. You can see all that crackling coming through. It is in the paint, but it's also in the primer and it goes right through. And then when you came up a little bit, it went away and it was perfect. All the joints failed after 50 years. So people say, well, don't put that much Bondo. Well, look, 50 years, really? If you drove this car like a normal everyday car in all weather, it wouldn't last 50 years anyways. If you're expecting to get more than 50 years out of a car, I'd have to ask you how long you plan on being around. None of us are going to be around. So expectations is something you've got to think about and manage. If you're going to build one, you're going to do whatever you're going to do. Do you have a local guy that's willing to do what I'm willing to do? Now, some of the big shops, they won't even do this anymore. They're going to say, no, I do Camaros. I do Mustangs, uh, all new parts only. We swap it all out. We weld it all together. We body work it. We paint the car. Everything is a gazillion dollars, and that's just the way it is. Uh, then there's other shops. They don't want to do this much work. So they might do a scuff shoot and a refresh, like collision shops. And it's not because they can't do the work. They just, they're busy and they don't have the time. You know, we took the time to clean this all up and we just kind of sprayed it in with a, uh, a semi-gloss black. Just so that everything behind the bumper and grill is at least not blue. And it was all nasty oil undercoating junk in there. So it had to be cleaned up anyways. Um, this is not a show winner car. It's just going to be a clean car in the, you know, at the local show and shine, right? We painted the horns. We went over some of the wires and stuff. They were kind of ratty. If a guy wanted those nice look, he'd, uh, he'd replace that. But you can see it's clean. It's presentable. You know, it's nice. Engine's clean. It's obviously when we're done the body and paint, he's going to have to shampoo and detail it all out. You know, we blacked out some of this stuff. We didn't go crazy. In fact, he didn't even pay for that. We just did it to clean the car up. You know, under the fender wheel wells, we're not going to touch. Um, we will let the overspray blow in there a bit, so it'll get blacked out. Whole car is going to be satin black. We're going to put a little bit of the trim on, but not all of it. Just the stuff we want. So it'll be a nice, clean hot rod. So the case study car. You follow the rules it'll be fine and rule number one should always be this stop going on forums and saying how do you guys do this how do you guys do that yes it's nice to have help but when you look at the answers and you see 50 different answers there's a reason for that nobody's using the same products you need to read your tds that's your technical data sheet for the product you're using if you stand by that and you just use the Bodywork 101 rules, lots of tooth, you know, you should be okay to achieve something that'll last, you know, even somewhat a long time. Even if you're, you realize, wow, I shouldn't have painted. My first car painted sucks, but it's good enough I can drive it around and have fun with it. It'll still last a while if you followed those basic instructions. So you, you got you to gotta read. You got to go by the TDSs, and that'll usually get you there. Um, some primers direct to metal. Some are direct to substrate. Some are direct to substrate, but they say can go over metal. Well, that just means if you had a little breakthrough, let's pretend that was metal, you know, it might be okay. It's probably going to stick just fine. Doesn't mean it can't have a reaction if there's some weird thing. Now, another thing... Uh, I'm going to say don't get caught up into using 50 different products. So what I like to do, anything deep or anything where it's been welded, we'll put a little bit of fiberglass filler on first. That's your fiber reinforced body filler. 
and we add just a touch of resin to it. And it basically, any little pinholes that maybe you missed or you couldn't see, uh, it'll kind of waterproof that. It'll go in and glue it shut. And if you're going to fill anything a little deep, it's a little more sound. And you don't want to put too much, but just put a little bit on. And when you do your filler over top, you're not just depending on the filler only. So this car didn't have any of that. It now does. And then the filler's even less. So technically, this car should go longer than it did last time, which means I should be above 50 years. And you see a little bit of white, a little bit of green, a little bit of yellow. That's just fillers with different hardeners. Sometimes you go so far and it's like, well, I, I got to see what I'm doing so you can change your hardener. Sometimes it's green, sometimes it's blue, sometimes it's red. And some reds turn bricky red, some reds turn pink. Um, we're not too fussy with that. Hardener is hardener is hardener. Usually I just tell them, yeah, bring me a couple blue ones and a red one. You know, and sometimes they come with the pinky red. Sometimes they come with the brick red. I don't think that's going to make much difference. But there you have it. This car was done very poorly, according to today's standards. And he got 48 drivable years, driving this every summer since 1974, with no issues up until 48 years later. Now it's been 50 years, and it's going to be back on the road soon, and I think it's going to be pretty sweet. Now, we haven't been doing two years worth of body work. Basically, in that time, he did the different wheels, the suspension drop, the brakes, the engine clutch. He redid the whole car mechanically. Then he brought it to me last fall. It is now late spring. We did some work on it in the fall. Then we stored it, and I pulled it out early spring. And now it's been a month and a half later, and this is where we're at, and the car is just about done. Now, to take this down to metal and do all those things and spend crazy money and do a full resto... Uh, you know, remake quarters by hand because you can't buy nothing. Well, we wouldn't be nowhere near done yet. But this is going to be a real nice car that a guy can drive. So you just got to ask yourself what your expectations are. Don't get caught up in all the craziness where everything has to be a certain way unless you're made of dollars and time. And, you know, everybody wants their stuff right now. Nobody's got any money. And that's the reality for most people. So... Is it okay if I, as a guy at home, just does this? Will it work? Yeah, well, people pay me to do this every day, and it holds up. Thanks for watching. Hope this was helpful. Cheers.